Hello friends, welcome to EPG Partshala. I am Dr. Jayadeep Shorangi, Department of English, Jogesh Chandra Choudhury College, University of Calcutta, Kolkata. Friends, we are into module 16, Elizabethan age in paintings and pictures. So that we are to study the interface between literature and art. Friends, this module is prepared by Dr. Kolyani Dikshit, who teaches English in a college in Lucknow. Our objectives in this particular module is to study the paintings, the historical context, the political context, the background with reference to the Renaissance, doctrines of Renaissance, products of Renaissance as a whole the contribution of literary stuff. That means, we have to study the interface between literary tradition and the work of art. Friends, to start with the Elizabethan age, it extends from the accession of Queen Elizabethan to the throne of England in the year 1558 AD and to the demise of James I in 1625. So, it is about an age that is between 1558 to 1625. It welcomed some fresh influences imported from other countries like Italy, France, France and Germany. It encouraged movements like reformation in order to reform the English society and the church. And nevertheless, the most important factor during this time is the influence of the Renaissance. Friends, as you see on the screen, the defeat of the Spanish Armada. Forces of Queen Elizabeth defeated the Spanish Armada, which was very important in the context of the history. The defeat of the invincible Armada made England a world class power. And remember, England announced its political arrival with this particular event. It introduced the effective long range weapons into naval warfare for the first time. Look up there again, the age of Spencer, source of image, this year taken, the age of Shakespeare, all come under this particular banner, the age of Elizabeth. Now, the historical background, the queen increased English boundaries at oceans. She encouraged expeditions of discovery and look at the map England now and it will be expanded very soon. Queen Elizabeth's accession of the English throne in 1558, that mar marked the beginning of a very important age. England also witnessed nine years war with Spain, spanning between 1594 and 1603 AD. And you can easily understand that the time Shakespeare was writing plays. Now, here are some important facts about the political background of the age. Elizabethan age was the specimen of peace, balance and steadiness. The queen achieved proper balance at both the fronts inside and outside England. She followed the policy of compromise, balance and stability. The queen was supreme head 
of the church and the state. Therefore, it was easy for her to control, have control over all administrative works. It was a phase of religious tolerance. Protestants and Catholics followed her with equal devotion. That was a mastery of the queen. Anglican church turned into reality due to the efforts of the queen. It was also called the age of conspiracies and planning. Riddle plot, Zucker plot, Bannington plot, with such plots. In the boy plot, Catholics planned to kidnap King James and the famous gunpowder plot. You will come across the reference to the gunpowder plot in the play Macbeth by Shakespeare. Drake's voyages wrote a new history and opened up new gates for the colonization. Industrial towns were providing employment. Writings of Hackett inspired Christopher Marlowe to make Dr. Foster's assign the new tasks to Mephistopheles. I hope in your module with Christopher Marlowe or University will, which will familiarize with Dr. Foster's. Now, friends, the political allegories were very prominent of the time and mostly by Edmund Spencer. The Fairy Queen became very popular text and written as a political allegory. Gloriana represents Queen Elizabeth. Author's love for Fairy Queen Gloriana represent, represents Lord Leicester's soft feelings for the Queen. Arthur's enmity with giant or giolo represents Leicester's wars against the Roman Catholic faith. Archimago represents Philip II of Spain. Friends, on the screen there is a tree, family tree of James the first. Any wife, eight children, only three survived. Eldest son, Henry, Princess of Wales, died in typhoid in the year 1612. Second son, Charles, became King Charles I. Daughter, Elizabeth, married to Frederick. These are very important in the history of England. After this family tree, here up the cultural background of the age. It starts with, it is an age of learning. People started learning different gamuts of meanings, different sources, different texts. It is the age of violence, brutality, superstitions, court corruptions and intellectual liberty freedom. There are great advances in the field of human anatomy, vistas are touched upon, surgical operations. That means, there was great discovery in clinical medical fields. And the medicines made his, this period scientifically advanced, because new discoveries were made. And no one can forget Galileo, the invention of thermoscope, hydrostatic balance are two prominent and signal contributions that mark the age very special. Despite such inventions, scientific advances, people still had strong faith in superstitions, witchcraft traditions and supernaturalism. These people believed in magic mystery. Supernatural powers, witches, ghosts, spirits, devils, black earth, 
and magic in the text text that we come across in this age there are references to witchcraft tradition black magic which is ghost spirits and supernatural machineries it was a great age of learning and knowledge and no one can forget francis bacon who made science and philological as well as philosophical entanglements to make it very special. New scientific theorists emerged astrology, alchemy, magic, witchcraft, tradition, reading witchcraft, palmistry were very popular. Rayleigh favored the nature of magic to the alchemists. Bacon solved the problems that were the source of tension for Raleigh. The court was inspired, Campion to compose songs, Spencer to write spousa verse, pro Prothalmian, Davids wrote orchestra, a poem of dancing. Queen's Court festivals gave opportunities to poets actors, musicians and craftsmen to perform and popularize their art and tradition. So friends, look up there, there we have a demonstrated picture, Elizabethan music, that is the church music, madrigal music and secular music. Music played an important role in the Elizabethan age. And friends, the Elizabethan age is marked by the overwhelming championing presence of the Renaissance, means Rebet. A fresh movement from Italy and France reached England in the form of the Renaissance. The Renaissance means in all pervasive, in music, in painting, in art in sculpture, in all forms of life. Renaissance is identified as the revival or rebirth of classical learning and arts from the bones of dogmatic and rigid opinions. English literature also received love for beauty, sensuousness, rich color effect from the Italian sculptor and painting. So, it was a fresh air for everyone. Sailors' voyages were touching new horizons and new harbors. That means new islands were discovered. So, geographical discovery, discoveries were also important in this age. Friends, after Renaissance, there comes Reformation. Reformation was a political and religious movement against the vices of the Catholic Church and Roman papacy. So, when there was orthodoxy, the orthodoxy was challenged by the crusaders by the and by a new kind of enlightenment. Man's spiritual freedom was proclaimed in the reformation. Previously, it was designed and charted in the hands of the church only. Mallory's mood to Arthur is an important text. Erasmus's praise of folly is another important text of note. Thomas More's important text Utopia is a fresh reading which gave new dimensions to the readers. Spencer, like a true child of the Renaissance, popularized humanism in the form of literature, in the form of literary discourse. He wrote in order to reform society, to make a society out of equality and free from all curses. Friends, look up there, Queen Mary and Princess Elizabeth entering London, look at the source of the image as painting. Queen Elizabeth's tomb, 14 March 1603 death of Queen Elizabeth, 
James I ascended to the throne of England and Scotland and 1628 death of James I at the age of 58. So friends, in this particular module, we try to trace out the implications of the Renaissance, Reformation under different heads as art and literary traditions. That means, we try to bring to our notice how the art and culture contributed to literary productions, literary giants and to make it a symphonious overtone and overwhelming amalgamation of literary forms with art forms. Hope you enjoyed paintings, songs, sculptors, the spirit of the Renaissance, the reformation, man's freedom from the bondage and a free air everywhere. I hope you enjoyed this module very much. Thank you. Hi guys, this week we're going to be taking on kind of an obscure period as far as wargaming goes. For some reason, and the period I'm referring to here is the Elizabethan era, by the way, for some reason there aren't all that many figures out there and there aren't very many very extensive ranges available for this period. I don't know what it is, but apparently people just don't want to be wargaming in this period. Uh, most people seem to favor sort of the later sort of English Civil War type era, which kind of followed after it, but the Elizabethan period, not so much. Um, and it's hard to kind of sub in other sort of later or earlier figures because the costumes of that period were quite specific looking. So, you know, you kind of have to use just the right thing or it ends up looking strange. Um, but there are a few companies who do ranges of Elizabethan figures. The one, of course, that comes most to mind is Foundry. I know they're you know, one that I talk about a lot for obvious reasons, and they've been around a lot, but they do, like them or not, have a very good variety of different historical eras that they cover, even some of these kind of stranger ones that don't get as much attention. And I like the Elizabethan era personally. I mean, it's certainly popular in movies and on TV, you know, and in books, really, really popular, but I don't know, maybe people don't think, at least in England, maybe people think there weren't enough big wars going on or something. I'm not sure what it is exactly, why it doesn't get wargamed more, but from a painter's perspective anyway, it's really cool because you've got some really interesting, really spectacular looking costumes. There was a lot of color, a lot of embroidery. Uh, that's not necessarily easy, but if you are into that kind of thing, it could be really fun and really challenging. And the figure that I am going to be doing is this guy, and he is indeed from Foundry, as I mentioned earlier, because they really just have the best and biggest selection of Elizabethan uh, units, as far as I am aware, anyway. I've already prepped him, as usual, with a gray base coat and painted his face and um, beard and mustache there, so that that is all ready to go. Uh, no, he's sort of a guardsman. I think he comes from a sort of a command pack that they make, which includes sort of guards and um, drummers and herald types that would sort of fit in then with um, some nobles or whatever. But I don't have that set. I just have sort of the guardsman set. But I think there's still a fair amount of flexibility in how this guy can be painted. And um, as you can see, he was, um, and here I'll show you again, he's wearing quite a bit of armor. He's got um, really a breastplate, gauntlets, you know, full arm protection, a helmet, all that on. So there's a fair amount of armor there, and I thought that might be an interesting opportunity for me to show you something about uh, making more ornate armor, because especially in this period, you know, sort of armor making, armor craft really sort of reached its pinnacle, and of course very soon after that it became obsolete due to firearms, but at this period they were still making a lot of really ornate pieces of armor, more and more, of course, for a sort of parade and just sort of show purposes, but they were still doing it, and there was a lot of uh, engraving on the armor, a lot of um, gold, uh, they were coloring their armors, adding a lot of ornate sculpting on it. Um, so what I'm going to be doing here with, on this guy is I'm going to be showing you how to do uh, colored armor because, you know, they, that happens, uh, it happened earlier in earlier periods too, where armor might be black and uh, I think they may have even 
tinted it other colors as well. But I'm going to show you how to do, in this case, a blackened armor, and then also one that has like sort of a gold um, engraving on it as well. So you can really get a sense of how to do that that sort of that type of thing. And his clothes are going to be rather ornate as well. Um, I'm obviously not going to go really too overboard on it for time reasons, but I am going to show you a little bit more how to do some sort of embroidery work and some decoration on some of his clothes because that's something you'll see if you look at Elizabethan portraits time and time again. They're, they had a, the color palettes, they liked reds, whites, blacks, or a lot of black being worn in that period, but a lot of their clothes were very intricately worked with lots of embroidery. So that was a really kind of important decorative element at that point. So I want to show you a little bit about how you could do that. And I think these techniques, both on the armor and on the clothing, those are going to be applicable to both earlier and later periods, you know, depending on where your interest lies. So why don't we just go right ahead and get started. So I'm going to start out with the armor itself here, because that's obviously the most important feature of this figure. And as I said, it was going to be uh, black and armor, so obviously you're going to want to use black as a base coat and this is to be fair not pure black I have taken Vallejo black here and I have mixed in a bit of Vallejo German gray and then because this is armor and it is metal and we do want to get a slight metallic effect here I have taken some Vallejo air gun metal which is a nice dark metallic color and I've mixed a very small amount into here it shouldn't be so much that it really overwhelms the um, black or the gray because we you know we, we want it to clearly be black and gray and not overly shiny but there should always in every step of this process where you're painting the armor there should be a small amount at least a small amount of metallic paint there so you can see I've base coated all of the armor and the helmet in preparation for the next step And now I'm going to begin the process of highlighting once that base coat is dry. My first base coat is just going to take some pure German gray with, once again, a little bit of that gun metal mixed into it. And I'm just going to very carefully start applying it to the armor. Uh, at this point, you're probably going to want to be putting it pretty much everywhere, just really avoiding all the seams and joints in the armor and any, you know, those kinds of areas or maybe very deep recesses under the arms. But basically, you're going to want to put this everywhere and you can blend it out that's what i'm doing here so when it is headed towards darker areas i obviously blend it out so that you can get a little bit more variation in color and even at this early stage in the highlight process it's really never too early to start doing that blending because the end result will be so much stronger that way <laughs> I'm going to continue this highlighting process now by taking that color that I already had, so the German gray with a little of the gun metal in it, and adding a bit of uh, Vallejo silver gray into that. Remember, we're going for black armor here. You don't want it to get too light, so be very sparing here. Don't put very much of the silver gray in because it's a light color and it'll really it'll brighten your color up very quickly if you're not careful. Also, I should point out, this camera really makes uh, the figure look quite a bit brighter than it does in real life. The actual figure, it, pick, it picks it up, and I think that may have something to do with all the metallic particles and the paint that I'm using. It really makes it, reflects the light, makes it look lighter than it actually is. Because in real life, if you see this figure, it's actually substantially darker than it appears to be here. So just keep that in mind when you're watching this. So anyway, I put a little bit of that silver gray in to lighten it up, and I'm applying as a highlight to areas like, you know, sort of the tops of his arms, his shoulders, the top of his helmet and its crest, you know, and as usual, I'm blending it outward. You can see I'm spending a special extra good time on the front of his breastplate, because obviously I figure a lot of light's going to be hitting there, especially on one side, and it's really clearly sort of fades out to, work, to his underarm region. So yeah, with this color, apply it, don't, you know, don't make it too strong and apply it gradually and blend it out. Uh, I actually did this in two steps, so I made one mix with the silver gray and then I added even slightly more silver gray for even higher highlight, which I used very sparingly indeed for high, doing some edge highlighting where you'd really expect there to be, you know, really, you'd really want that a lot of contrast. But because we're working with dark armor here, don't go too overboard with that. Now, once I have finished 
with the, this sort of application of the grays, I am going to be applying two washes to my model. The first one is going to be Vallejo Gunmetal, Vallejo Air Gun Metal, sorry, which I'm going to take, and I'm going to thin it down a whole bunch. So you really, really want it thin, you really watery, because it's an extremely um, pigmented color anyway, so you have to really, really, really thin it down. But I'm gonna make it into a wash, and I'm gonna apply that very, very lightly, and it needs to be very light indeed, so that it doesn't get too shy. I'm gonna apply it very, very, very lightly as a wash all over the armor. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna add a sort of a metallic g gleam uh, to the armor. But it's really, really easy to get to do this too much and get too shiny. It actually picks up quite a bit lighter here than it is in person, as I said again. But you're gonna apply this very lightly, very thinly all over the model to add this real, this sort of metallic quality to what you're doing. And it does make a really big difference. Um, and then I'm gonna do a second wash after this dries. Um, using Nuln Oil, which is a black wash, and that'll help, and that especially helps if you think it's gotten too shiny or too light, that'll help to darken it down, uh, unify the colors a little bit more, and get, you know, get your sort of that blackness back in the armor, which is, of course, really important here, because you definitely, you definitely want to preserve that above everything else when you're trying to make this type of look. I'm now pretty satisfied uh, with the black, so I'm going to move on to the engraving. And in this period, it's pretty common. You'll see more ornate armor, especially, will have sort of, sort of brass gilded sort of engraving lines running along it. Now, at this scale, you can't put too much detail into those. It, you, if you see them up close, you'd see they have like etching with dark patterns and you know some of the metal showing in between there. But here, really, all you're really capable of is putting just down lines of the that color. And what I've done here is I've taken some German camouflage black brown and mixed some Vallejo Air gold into it to make a base color. And now I'm applying edging with it to parts of the armor where I think it should go. Don't. Basically, my, what I'm doing here is basically running it along the edges where there's, where there's you know, separate pieces of armor. I'm not doing that everywhere, but I'm doing it almost all places. You can kind of see along all those segments on the arm and on his helmet, you know, around all of the edges, you know. You, you kind of have to use your judgment. On his breastplate, I put several lines down the middle. Uh, and this is just kind of basically defining these these areas. This is sort of the shade color for them. And keep the color nice and thin because you need to make fine lines and so you really need it to flow quite a bit. So don't let, don't let your paint get too thick here or you're going to run into problems. But don't worry, if you do make a mistake, it's not too hard to go back and correct it with a little more of that gray-black paint that you have probably already mixed up. And once the uh, lines of engraving are plotted out, you can start highlighting them. And I'm using, as a first highlight, I'm using just pure Vallejo Air Gold. And it's a really simple matter of going back over the lines with that color, especially where you want there to be light. And you're going to want to go over pretty much the entire line surface, except maybe very much at the edges where it's about to sort of hit a shadowed area. But mostly you want to put this pretty much everywhere and you'll have to keep it thin once again so it flows nicely so you may find that you need to go over some areas a couple of times i'm being a little bit fancier on his crest because i have more room there so i've i've edged the top and bottom and then i'm sort of making little squiggles in between that area to sort of g give the effect that there's sort of a design there you can kind of just be a little vague with it but it's a nice feature to just try that out once I have finished applying just the pure gold, I'm then going to take some Vallejo Air or Silver, or you can use Steel, it doesn't really matter. And I'm going to mix a bit of that into the gold so that I can get an even higher highlight color, which I am then going to apply much more sparingly to that uh, bronze gold edging, you know, putting it just very small amounts where I think light is going to hit. As I said before, that's a great, that makes it a great highlight for gold areas if you want it to look really shiny and blingy, but you have to be a little bit careful because if you put too much on, you won't look gold anymore and you're going to lose the golden effect. So it's something that has to be done um, a little bit carefully. When you're done with this, you can look, kind of evaluate the figure, which I haven't actually shown this here, but if you see that there are any lines, like especially on the breastplate, you'll see this, where you don't think there's good enough definition between the, um, the bronze 
and or the brass, gold, whatever, and the dark metal. You can go back in with either some black or some just pure German gray, and you can make a very thin line there, sort of as an edge for your gold. That is helpful in some places where it, 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 there's not a clear enough contrast to help really add even further definition between those gold etched stripes on the armor and the darker black base. Now that I'm satisfied with the armor, I'm going to be moving on to his pantaloons and the interior of his cloak, because in this period it was pretty popular to use a contrasting fabric on the interior of your cloak, and cloaks were in general quite fashionable, so, you know, you, this is something that you're going to see quite a bit in this period. I have decided to go for sort of a grayish white color for these areas and I am base coating them all right now with a mix of silver gray from Vallejo and just a bit of the German gray just to darken it down. But overall you should be aiming kind of for a rather light uh, gray bordering on black on um, white here. So that's give you some sense of what you need to be striving for. <laughs> And now I'm going to highlight those areas using just uh, pure, plain silver gray from Vallejo. And because it's a lighter color, it's obviously more transparent, so you'll probably find you may need, you'll you have to go back over those areas maybe a couple times to build up enough color. And you can see I'm just applying it first to the lightest areas and then sort of blending it out. You want to keep it dark, obviously, sort of inside the cape, and you want to leave clear, defined lines between the puffs and his pants. And then once I have finished using the silver gray as a highlight, I am next going to take just plain old pure white and I'm going to use that as sort of my final highlight layer and that goes doubly for the white, what I just said about applying several layers because white, more than any color in my experience, always takes more layers to really build up enough whiteness and enough brightness that it's really clear and, you know, obvious what you're doing. So, yeah definitely be prepared to go back with the white and, you know, work it over these areas several times. And now I'm going to leave those white gray areas for a little bit and move on to his breeches and the outer fabric of his cloak, which I've decided I'm going to be doing in a nice, brilliant red color. So I am base coating everything here with Vallejo black red because as, especially as I mentioned in my last tutorial it's a great base for creating a really r rich deep red that you can then really build up to be really brilliant on your highlights so yeah just go ahead and slap this down everywhere <laughs> and now in order to um, highlight this guy on his cloak and breeches, I'm going to be taking some Citadel Mephiston Red. It's a base color, so it's kind of thick. It coats quite well. And in this case, though, I actually have thinned it down because I, in purpose because I want it to go on a little bit more transparently so I can build it up a little bit more slowly. And you can always do this with colors. You know, if they are a color that you that actually is one that, that coats nice and thick right out of the bottle, and, and you want to just kind of just slow that process down a little bit, you can always thin it. And that's what I've done here. So I'm going to be applying it here all over his um, his breeches and cloak. And also you can see there's a little tassel, one of the tassels on his spear. I'm also gonna be doing that in red, you can see. So I'm applying that, especially sort of the tops of creases and where light's heading and really and blending it out. So I'm initially starting out with a fairly, you know, dark shade of red, and then I'm gonna go back over these areas multiple times, two or three times, really with the same color, and just keep building up and keep getting it brighter and brighter and brighter uh, increasingly and putting increasingly less paint down, you know, and only focusing in the areas where I want it to be extra, you know, really to extra brilliant looking on the finished model. So as you can see now, I already have a pretty nice rich red color, but that's still really not sufficient as far as I'm concerned. So I'm going to be applying now Evil Sun Scarlet from Citadel on, and that's a layer color, and I'm going to use that to even further brighten and highlight my red. And as you can see, that's really going to go mostly on the tops of folds. There are a ton of those in the pants and along the high creases on his cloak. And it's really going to really make that red pop out, really make it uh, brilliant and really you're going to see a really great contrast between the sort of the shadow areas and the highlight 
areas on the red. And this paint is naturally pretty thin, so you don't really need to thin it at all like I did with the base color earlier. You can really just put it straight out of the bottle and you are not going to need to apply nearly as many layers of it either. It's pretty strong and you know, it, it, you just it's just not going to be necessary to build it up quite so much. And this is really my favorite step when I'm painting red because the results are so really immediate and satisfying and you get this really incredible rich color that really looks like you put a lot of time and effort into to get that, you know, that all that, that depth but it's actually in my experience at least not nearly so um, difficult as it may actually appear to be now I'm going to return to the white areas and apply sort of a pattern which is very similar to the one I did in my tutorial last week if you watch that which is to sort of paint uh, intersecting diagonal lines so that you get a sort of a diamond crosshatch effect and then make the very sort of finest indication of some little dots or lines in each of those diamonds look like there's some flowers or something in there. And I know this is a little bit tricky, but it was so commonly done in this period to have brocaded fabric that you probably really, you know, you, you probably should try to do it if you can. And if you are not confident, you can always choose smaller areas like this. They're much easier to paint. They don't have the complexities of dealing with a big surface, but they're still going to add that extra detail and extra impact that you, you really will get, you know, from a larger area. In some ways they're nicer because you don't really overwhelm the figure with all this tiny detail. Sometimes you can actually over decorate a figure. So yeah, I think this is this is a great place to choose these patterning. And what I've used here to paint this is I've taken the uh, the um, that um, silver gray again and I've mixed German gray into it to get a reasonably sort of nice medium gray color and I've thinned it quite a bit so it goes on real easy. That's super important when you're painting fine lines like this. Um, and that's, I'm going to use that to sort of trace out the pattern and then I'm going to go back in with that same color but with more of the silver gray add to lighten it and I'm going to just carefully do a little bit of highlighting on the areas of extra light. And you can also take some white and go back in and clean up around the edges if you made any kind of mess while doing this. Uh, now I'm going to move on to painting our soldiers' uh, hose and um, lace ruff. Lace ruffs are sort of this super common, popular, fashionable element in this period and that continued obviously into the 16th and 17th century. I am base coating these areas using um, foundry boneyard medium. Really straightforward here. And then I am going to take uh, foundry boneyard light and use that sort of as my second highlight and finally then take just pure white and that will be my final highlight. I opted not to use the full boneyard triad here because I didn't want it to be so dark in the darkest areas if that makes sense. I wanted it to start with a slightly lighter base and these are quite small simple areas so you shouldn't have too much trouble with um, highlighting or blending, especially on the on the rough here, you really just need to make sure the base coat is really really coats down in all of the crevices. But then when you go back into highlight with the boneyard light and the white, you really just need to sort of make sure that that gets onto the onto the top surfaces and those outer edges. You can kind of just leave the interiors of all those little um, rough things. You can just kind of leave those as the base color. <laughs> Next, I'm going to be moving on to his sash, which he kind of wears across his chest, his um, feather on his helmet, and also the second sort of, I guess, tassel that he's got on the spear. And I kind of decided that yellow might be a really pretty accent color to use for those areas. And as most of you probably know, yellow can be a little bit of a tricky color to do because there's, you know, it's, it tends to be really transparent, like red can be sometimes. So you have to treat it carefully, and it's good to start with a nice dark base color. So what I've chosen to use as the base for these yellow areas is Foundry Butterfly Shade, which I'm just going to apply very heavily on all of these regions. And then in order to uh, highlight the yellow, I'm going to start out with an initial, um, well, sort of the initial highlight color here is going to be the ochre shade color from Foundry. And this is going to go pretty much everywhere, except really down the recesses. And what you will probably see at this point is that our color really looks a lot more orange than it does yellow. 
And that's okay, because I think yellow, the shade is sort of dark shade colors of yellow do actually tend to look orange, you know, when there's a lot, when there's not very much light on there's, there's, there's a reason for that. They're very related. So that makes sense here that you want to start sort of as sort of orangey colors as a shade on your yellow. And then once I've done that to my satisfaction, I'm then going to take the ochre medium color and start applying that. And that is a very distinctly yellow color. Now you can see, and you want to apply enough of it that it, you know, it cancels out that orange for the most part. And, it, and it, this will now look very clearly like a sort of a nice rich yellow color, not really like orange anymore. And then of course, to finish this off, the most important thing is, you know, how you highlight it. And in particular, with that sash and the tassel and the spear, you want those to feel kind of shiny, a little silky satiny. That, at least that's how I imagine it. So I'm going to be using very, very light colors of the final highlight. I'm going to be taking a boneyard medium and I'm going to be taking boneyard light. And I'm going to be applying those uh, carefully sort of on high areas and sort of blending them outwards. And that, because I've chosen this very light, almost white, yellow color, uh, it's going to give the effect of, that of, of this sort of shininess, sort of glossiness. And you can do that on the feather too, but be careful there a little bit more. You only want to put those really light colors really sort of on the, the top and on sort of some of those individual strands. You need to be, you know, you don't want that to get everywhere. But in general, this is always a good tip if you want to make look kind of satiny, silk, effects on your fabric is to make sure your final highlight colors are very much lighter than the rest of the thing and then you know blend them out really extensively <laughs> Our soldiers then also got a few leather areas on him, and to keep this really simple, I'm going to be doing them all sort of with the same colors. So I'm going to be painting his shoes, his belt, and his scabbard, first using German camouflage black-brown, as I usually do. Uh, and then I'm going to be putting a sort of a general overall highlight of Bay Brand Medium on these things, and then continuing on, in my typical fashion, taking some chestnut shade and applying that very carefully as sort of an edge highlight and blending it out so that it doesn't get too strong or too red and finishing off with the chestnut medium as even higher very fine highlight especially along the edges of the belt and that scabbard you're going to be, want to be a little bit more careful on those shoes you don't want them to get too you know too bright and too red looking and as a matter of fact you can do like i did when i was finished i felt like those shoes actually need to be toned down just a little bit more and i because i thought they'd just gotten a little too bright and i therefore took some agrix earth shade wash and i applied that over the shoes which also helps because this particular style has a lot of open work in it and that was uh, you know a good way to, ex to put extra emphasis on those recesses that were there and, you know, and also give them a slightly different shade than the other leather areas had. And then I quickly painted the spear shaft and I kept this quite simple. I just used the um, foundry spear shaft triad, so the, the spear shaft shade followed by the spear shaft medium and then the finally the spear shaft light. This was actually fairly easy to do just because there's a very clear directionality here. The light is clearly going to be hitting the front and not so much the back where it's facing in towards him. So you can sort of apply the base color and then apply the medium and highlight colors then more only to the front and then sort of blend them out towards the back. And then, even though I spent quite a lot of time on that metal armor already, there are still a couple of other metal areas on, on the figure that I decided I would do separately, which include his uh, spear point and then sort of the hilt and guard on his dagger and his sword. Uh, the, the spear point I base coated with a mixture of German gray and some uh, Vallejo Air steel. And then I went ahead and highlighted it uh, with um, with more with a much higher ratio of the steel in the German gray and then finally just pure steel kind of along the cutting edge which I blended out. 
Uh, for the uh, for the sword hilts, I just took, as I often do, the German camouflage black brown mixed with some gold. Same thing I basically did in the armor, and I applied that as a base coat. And then I highlighted, just as I did before, using first just pure Vallejo Air gold, and then following up on extra you know extra bright areas with a mixture of the silver and the gold and of course applying that only in very small amounts for that extra impact. And okay, here is our finished Elizabethan era type guard or soldier type figure. I hope I, this has been a useful tutorial to you. I know, as I said in the beginning, this is a relatively uncommon era when it comes to war gaming. Nonetheless, I know that there are some techniques in here that are going to be useful elsewhere, like how to do the dark armor with the etching on it. I know I've had at least a couple of requests for that that type of thing, so I think that should be useful to everybody. And of course, another, you know, kind of a small amount on painting patterns, because that's always something people are interested in. And also, of course, this period has a lot of overlap with the whole sort of colonial conquistador period for obvious reasons. So even if you're not into the actual Elizabethan era warfare, this will have really nice parrot as well as if you're going to be painting Spanish soldiers, because it's basically the same time and you're going to have the same kinds of armor coming into play. So if you liked this video, uh, please share it with your friends. Uh, leave me some comments with what you thought. Uh, you can also like the video itself, of course, and definitely do subscribe if you have not had a chance to do so already. And so I guess then I will seek you next week. And until then, as always, happy painting.